And I am going to turn this over right away to Elsa Huxley and let Elsa do the formal introductions. Elsa? OK, thanks so much, Susan. Good afternoon, everybody. We're so glad you're joining us today. Um, I'm going to make a brief introduction to the community and the webinar, and then we'll get started. Uh, Heritage Preservation is moderating the uh, Connecting to Collections online community in cooperation with the American Association for State and Local History and with funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. The site is designed and produced by Learning Time. The goal of the online community is to help smaller museums, libraries, archives, and historical societies quickly locate reliable preservation resources and network with their colleagues. In developing the community, we have drawn on many resources that were developed for the Connecting to Collections initiative, including the bookshelf, the Raising Labar workshops and webinars, and links to these resources are filed under the Topics menu on the site, and we'll also file a recording of today's webinar there. About twice a month, the Connecting to Collections online community features a particularly helpful preservation resource and hosts a webinar related to it. The resources we posted for today's webinar can be accessed by clicking this photo on our webpage at connectingtocollections.org. So today, I'm very pleased to welcome Elizabeth Joffrian, who's Senior Program Officer at the National Endowment for the Humanities in the Division of Preservation and Access. I'll just say a few words about Elizabeth, and then we'll get started. Uh, prior to joining NEH in 2006, she was the head archivist at the Center for Pacific Northwest Studies at Western Washington University and an affiliated faculty in its graduate program in archives and record management. She is currently an adjunct faculty member at Catholic University, where she teaches courses on archives and special collections. She has held previous positions at the Smithsonian Institution, including the National Portrait Gallery and the Archives of American Art. She has also held professional archival positions at the North Carolina State Archives and the Historic New Orleans Collection. She received an MA in History from the University of New Orleans and an MLIS from the University of Maryland. She currently coordinates the Preservation Assistant Grants Program for NEH. And we're so grateful that you're joining us today, Elizabeth. Thank you, Elsa, and uh, greetings to all of you, and thank you so much for joining me in a discussion of the funding opportunities offered by the National Endowment for the Humanities. As most of you know, the endowment has provided longstanding support for the nation's cultural heritage institutions, and it really is a pleasure to be here to, to be able to discuss a little bit about how NEH might assist your organization in the preservation of your collections. As you'll uh, see from the, well, let me flip through a couple of these slides here. Here, I'll pull up my presentation. There we go. We'll get through a couple of things here. And, and there we go. Great. Thanks, Elsa. Sure. Um, as you can uh, see from the agenda I have here, I plan to provide a very brief introduction to NEH and the programs we support. But today's webinar is going to focus specifically on just one of our grant opportunities, and that's our preservation assistance grants for smaller institutions known as known affectionately as PAG uh, throughout the NEH and beyond, and I'll certainly refer to it uh, by its acronym uh, in the course of our discussions today. Now, we're going to conclude our session with a few tips for preparing a competitive grant application. I think uh, probably most of you are probably here to learn a little bit about. And I envision this last piece really to be driven by your question. So be sure to have a few in mind for me, and we'll return to them uh, towards the end of our session. Um, in the process, I also hope to learn from you. I'm interested in the nature of your institutions, your preservation priorities, and how the PAG program has or can uh, address your preservation needs. So let's begin uh, by getting a sense of who's in the audience today. I, I want to start with just a quick poll to determine the nature and size of your institutions. And later, I'll be asking a few questions about your preservation priorities as well as your uh, experience in grant writing. So also, if we could bring up that first set of uh, poll questions. Sure. And so there are two questions here. One is your type of institution, and the other will uh, come up shortly, and it will be the size of your institution. And is there any way that I can get back to the, to the slide? Uh, not while we're running the poll. OK. Um, well, while you answer, I'll, I'll provide a little bit of context. The National Endowment for the Humanities uh, supports a number of divisions that award grants to a range of nonprofit cultural institutions including museums, archives, libraries, colleges and universities, uh, public radio and television stations, and even in some cases to individual scholars for the purpose of education, research, and public programming in the humanities. And uh, I'll bring up in just a second a slide that shows you uh, all of the divisions that, uh, that we have in the, in the endowment. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about uh, some of the kinds of activities that, that we support there. OK, it looks like people are finished uh, entering 
their mm -hmm. answers. So we've got 45% from a museum and 13% mm -hmm. from public libraries. And um, the institutional budgets, by a great majority, are under $250,000. So. Right. Well, that's fairly typical of what we see uh, okay. in the grant program and kind of what I expected uh, okay. to see here today, um, preponderance of museums, libraries, and, and lower budgets. So it sounds like we've got the right audience for, okay. uh, for the presentation I'm going to do today. Great. I'll pull these away. Thanks. Great. So this slide should give you a sense of the scope of NEH's programs and the kinds of activities we support, um, ranging from research fellowships to support for documentary film and exhibitions to the cataloging and digitization of collections. And uh, again, here's a list of all of NEH's funding divisions, uh, including the Division of Preservation and Access, and that's the part of the endowment that I represent. Now, the Division of Preservation and Access supports uh, many different kinds of funding opportunities specific to collections care. And you can find out more information about all of NEH's grant programs at our website at www.neh.gov. And uh, I've also uh, provided an email address here as well. And I've also provided a good bit of information about our programs in the link handouts available on the webinar site. Now this slide should give you a sense of the variety of different kinds of programs supported specifically by the Division of Preservation and Access. And unfortunately, we just don't have enough time for me to, to go into any e detail on these uh, grant programs uh, in the course of our discussion today. But uh, at the end, I'd be more than happy to bring this slide back up again, and we can talk uh, about any of the programs that you might have questions about. So for now, what I'll do is just give you a, a real quick overview of some of the typical activities that we fund in the Division of Preservation and Access. Uh, and you'll see that uh, essentially we support projects designed to extend the life of cultural collections and, and make them more widely accessible. Uh, the first ones listed uh, include activities or some of the activities funded uh, specifically by PAG. So it'll give you a, a preview of some of the things that we're going to talk about today. Uh, we also uh, fund a wide range of different kinds of collections and, and formats. And I hope this list uh, is also reflective of some of the uh, kinds of materials that you have in your own institutional repositories. So I think what I'd like to do before I get into some facts about the Preservation Assistance Grant Program is to, to get a sense of, of some of the resources that you feel are most at risk in your collections. And if you have uh, priorities that, that aren't reflected uh, in the list that Elsa is going to bring up uh, from our second polling question, um, you know, maybe materials like born digital or perhaps specific audiovisual formats, uh, we have the possibility of having a text box down here and go feel free to go ahead and add uh, anything that's not on this list. And what I'm trying to do is get a sense here of some of your priorities and, and get a sense of how well the, uh, the grant program is addressing those, those preservation needs. That'll be very important input uh, for me as well. OK, it looks like it's shaping out a lot of paper, books, journals, archives, and manuscripts, furniture, textiles, one, historical objects. Right. The one that's jumping out for me is furniture, textiles, and historical mm -hmm. objects. Um, we typically see an emphasis on photographs and moving images, but uh, I think this is reflective of some of the museums that we have in the, alpha, in the audience as well. OK. And there we have some more detail, historical city records, microfilm. Great. So a full range of different kinds of, of, uh, of resources. And, and you'll find that we'll have uh, ways to address some of that in some of the programs that we or, or um, activities that we support in PAG. Thank you, Elsa. Okay. Now what I want to do here is to provide a little bit of background on the uh, Preservation Assistance Grant Program and the kinds of activities that it supports. And I'll begin by addressing one of the most common misperceptions about NEH, and that's that we fund uh, only large, well-established institutions. In fact, uh, the Division of Preservation and Access launched uh, its PAG program in 2000 to enhance the capacity of small and mid-sized institutions to preserve their collections and to reach out to organizations that don't typically apply to PAG or to NEH. Uh, and in fact, the program is directed in large part at institutions that uh, often aren't able to compete effectively in our larger, more competitive grant programs. 
And we especially encourage uh, institutions that have never before applied to NEH to apply to this program. So in support of institutions like yours, preservation assistance grants provide up to $6,000 to help cultural repositories, uh, libraries, museums, historical societies, uh, historic sites, art and cultural organizations, town and county library, uh, records offices to better preserve their collections. We strive to ensure that these applications are easy to write. Um, we ask for just five page narratives, so very short uh, narratives compared to uh, many other grant programs. And your institution isn't required to contribute any cost share uh, to apply or any matching funds. The guidelines are online at www.neh.gov. And you'll see a, a tab there that says apply for a grant. And there's a, a listing by activity and alphabetically of all of the grant programs offered by NEH there. And the next deadline is on May 1st, 2012. So plenty of time to prepare an application ahead of that deadline. So as you can imagine, the potential audience for preservation assistance grants is huge. And in fact, uh, this is our largest grant program in the division and, and one of the largest in, uh, in the endowment overall, uh, based on the number of applications that we received. And based on your responses to the first question, I, I see many of the types of institutions that um, we support uh, in this audience. Uh, and we'll kind of compare what we just did a moment ago with uh, funding on, by institution type of PAG uh, over the last several years. And you'll see, not surprisingly, that about two-thirds of all preservation assistance grants uh, went to museums and libraries, as was reflected in this audience. So just quickly, I'll give you a few additional facts about the history of PAC funding and maybe give you a sense of the impact of the program to date. Uh, from 2000 to 2012, the divisions received a little bit over uh, 3,000 PAG applications requesting uh, over $16 million in funding. We've awarded nearly 1,600 PACs for a total of $7.5 million. And PACs have been made to every state, as well as the District of Columbia and several of the US territories. And in most years, we're able to fund about 40 to 50% of the applications we receive. And this is much higher than uh, most of our other grant programs that tend to weigh in at about the 14 to 15% uh, funding ratio. And in this slide, you'll get a sense of uh, the breakdown in number of applications by year with a comparison to the number of awards each year uh, in the dark blue there. So you'll see in most years that 40 to 50% ratio represented. So let's get to the heart of our webinar and, and take a look at the kinds of activities that a preservation assistance grant will support. Probably the most common application to the PAG program is for the hire of an outside consultant to conduct a general preservation assessment and to assist in drafting a long-range plan for the care of collections. This is typically considered to be the very first step in developing a preservation plan. And it can lay the groundwork for identifying strategic priorities and planning for future fundraising efforts. Uh, it turns out it's going to be a, a really informative document for your stakeholders and resource allocators. And, and it helps you make the case for the importance of your preservation needs and, and priorities. Uh, to those folks that, that uh, carry the power of the purse. Now, a typical uh, preservation site survey would address uh, building and environmental concerns. It would review the overall condition of collections. It would evaluate policies and procedures as they apply to preservation and provide recommendations for improving storage and handling practices. For example, uh, a few years back, uh, NEH made an award to the Atlanta Fulton Library System to hire a preservation specialist to assess a collection that documents the life of uh, writer Margaret Mitchell, uh, known, uh, famous for uh, Gone with the Wind. Um, as is typically the case, a consultant visited the institution to evaluate procedures and conditions affecting collections preservation and prepared a report that summarized their fundings and prioritized those recommendations. Uh, the library then used the report to plan for uh, future preservation efforts and successfully returned to NEH with a second PAG application to address those priorities. And that included the purchase of shelving, storage equipment and supplies, environmental monitoring equipment, a security camera, and uh, even uh, staff training and collections care. And I think this is a good example to begin with because it gives you a, a sense of the full range of the different kinds of uh, PAG uh, or activities that a preservation assistance grant will support. And we'll drill down a little bit more on that uh, in terms of, of future discussion. So um, just to do another polling question very quickly, I'm, I'm curious, how many of you have received a uh, general preservation assessment of your collections and facilities? And uh, how is that funded? And again, this information will be very useful to us because we, um, I think, operate still under the assumption that there are a lot of smaller institutions out there that haven't had that, that uh, general assessment yet. And uh, it's so important in terms of, of launching on that first step to a preservation plan. 
well, it looks like it's coming to, to fruition here in some of the statistics we're getting. So again, it seems like you're in the, in the right webinar. For those of you who haven't taken this step, I, I really encourage you to apply to pres for preservation assistance grants or, or to other funding sources, such as the CAP program, that's the Conservation Assessment Program, uh, administered by Heritage Preservation in cooperation with IMLS or, or other sources that, uh, that provide uh, funding and support for uh, preservation assessments. So it looks like a, a good half of you still need that assessment. So thanks for that input. That's good to know. Ready for me to pull it away? Or? Yeah, thanks. So. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, that initial preservation assessment would typically result in a detailed report with prioritized recommendations. And applicants can return to NEH for support for activities that might include uh, a range of specialized studies and plans, uh, such as establishing environmental monitoring programs or developing more detailed plans for improving environmental conditions. Uh, or planning for lighting systems or security or fire protection for collections. Or to develop and implement a plan for better storage of collections, such as uh, these baskets and oversized archival materials. Or for instituting an integrated pest management program, uh, such as an award uh, we recently made to the South Street uh, Seaport Museum in Lower Manhattan, uh, depicted on the left hand of your slide here. Or for assessing the conservation treatment needs of a selected item or items in a collection. Um, for example, uh, I believe it was last year we made an award to Washington University's Kemper Art Museum for the hire of a specialist to conduct a conservation assessment of ancient uh, Greek ceramics dating from the 6th century BC. And also to McAllister College, a, a small liberal arts school in Minnesota that receives, uh, has received several PAG awards from us over the years, including one that supported a specialized assessment of their audiovisual collections based on the recommendations of their first PAG. Um, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, we've seen many applications for assistance in developing the resources and skills needed to cope with disasters. And a PAC can assist in developing a plan for disaster and emergency response. And in fact, we often uh, find that this is one of the high priority recommendations in most general assessments, uh, probably not too surprisingly. Uh, PAC also supports the purchase of preservation supplies, such as cabinets and shelving units, storage containers, boxes and folders, or environmental monitoring equipment. And applicants uh, may also request support to send staff members to workshops and training courses that focus on the preservation of collections, or to hire a consultant uh, to do on-site training for your staff and volunteers. Um, we are aware at NEH that many smaller institutions operate with little or no professional preservation expertise. And these training efforts can assist you in acquiring the necessary skills, such as uh, proper methods and materials for the care of collections, uh, digital preservation, and disaster preparedness and response. Now, in some instances, uh, these training efforts involve collaborations among several organizations in a particular community. Uh, for example, after obtaining their first preservation assessment, the Sunflower Library System received a second award for training in disaster preparedness and emergency response for staff in five cultural institutions located in the Mississippi Delta region. As most of you know, uh, prone to uh, flooding and, and tornadoes, but as some of you may not know, uh, also, also to earthquakes. So it was really good to see these institutions begin to think collaboratively about how to deal with emergency response. The organizations involved, in addition to the Sunflower uh, Library, were the uh, B.B. King Museum, uh, Delta State University uh, Archives and Museum on their campus there, um, the Cottonlandia Museum, and the Delta Blues Museum in Clarksdale, which uh, for you blues fans uh, is uh, famous for being home of the crossroads. Now, a few years ago, uh, we expanded the kind of training that PAG supports. We recognized that smaller and mid-sized institutions are under a great deal of pressure to digitize their collections. And PAG now supports education and training in digital best practices, the care and preservation of digital resources, as well as cataloging and arrangement description of collections. And keep in mind, I'm, I'm talking about training here. Uh, PAG has also supported numerous digital preservation assessments, including recent awards to Valdosta College and to SUNY Albany for a survey of their digital uh, collections and the development of uh, digital preservation policies and procedures. And we'd really like to see, um, we'd like to see more uh, applications like that for digital assessments. It's something that we're really promoting in the program. So if you feel that that's something that would be useful for you, keep that in mind. Um, we've also supported training and education and best practices and standards for uh, digital preservation, including awards to uh, Brigham Young University for a collaborative uh, workshop 
uh, attended by 16 different institutions in Utah, and to Mills College Art Museum for two workshops on best practices and standards in sustaining digital collections and the proper care and handling of artwork undergoing digitization. And I understand uh, anecdotally that uh, Mills just recently received an IMLS grant uh, to digitize their collection, so there was a bit of a, a build-in there. Now, keep in mind, we're not able to support the development of digital management systems or the labor associated with digitization or cataloging through PAC. Um, we have other grant programs for that uh, in the division. But PAC does support assessments and education and training in these areas. And for many smaller institutions, it provides the groundwork needed to get started with sustainable digital programs. So to, to recap some of the activities we fund in PAG, um, again, these are small grants, uh, up to $6,000, easy to write, just five pages, no cost share, and the next deadline, again, is going to be uh, May 1st, 2012. And what I'd like to do is, uh, at this point is do maybe our, our, our last polling question. And, and I'd like to get some feedback from you that will give me a, a, a good sense of your needs and how we're meeting them uh, in this grant program. Um, and I'll have uh, they uh, also bring up a, a polling question that essentially uh, recaps the, the information on the slide. Um, and I'm wondering uh, which, if any, of these activities are priorities for your institution. Um, if your priorities in terms of your preservation concerns aren't reflected here, um, actually it was uh, question number, we'll do this one and then we'll go back to the, oh. to the other one. It was question number four. But this is good information, too. Give my voice a break as well. Right. <laughs> Sorry, let me pull the other one. Now, let's go ahead and let them do this, because okay. they'll feed in together. Um, and the other question will focus uh, essentially on within the, the kinds of activities that PAC supports, uh, areas that you feel are priorities for your institutions. And, uh, and I'm really quite interested in if there are priorities that you feel in terms of preservation that aren't reflected uh, in the list uh, that we'll bring up shortly. If, if you can let me know what those are, and, and we're always you know, seeking information from the field that helps us uh, uh, get a better sense of what's needed in terms of preservation planning and uh, preparedness. So I see uh, a lot of folks have not applied at all for grant funding, and uh, it's a preponderance of this group. At some point, maybe towards the end of the session, we can talk a little bit about those of you who applied uh, for grants and weren't unsuccessful, um, perhaps some of the obstacles that you felt uh, in terms of, of seeking grant funding. Well, it looks like we've got that framed out. And, and Elsa, if you wouldn't mind bringing up the, the fourth question. 57% was a little higher than I expected. But uh, again, I, I think it just reiterates that perhaps you're, this, is a, this will be good information for you. This is another multiple answer question. So, mm -hmm. so again, this would be your, your priorities in terms of preservation for your institution. And uh, for those of you, I, have, I, don't, I, I don't see any other answers yet. But if there are things that, again, we don't have listed here, uh, I would love to go back and, and discuss uh, what you feel your needs are in a little bit more detail. So that was at least one of you. I'm saving some of these questions, too, off to the side, and we'll go back and address I think that later. would be great. Yeah, okay. towards the end, it'll, we'll be able to yeah. go back and address in more detail um, some of these answers. So 75 of you feel, I think, that storage is a priority. And uh, we, we certainly do see a lot of applications in that area, uh, particularly from museums, libraries, uh, individuals who are dealing with special collections, uh, archival collections. Thank you. Again, this is very useful information to me. We will um, certainly fold it into our own planning and thinking uh, about the grant program. So like I said, this webinar is working both ways. I really appreciate the input. Should I pull this one aside now? Or? Yeah, let's go ahead and okay. do that. And we'll come back to some of this towards the end. So 
But what I'd like to do now is uh, talk about what it takes to write a competitive grant proposal to NEH. I think some of the information that you all were um, probably focusing in and hoping to get today. Um, and I'd like to begin with a few basic themes that underscore all funding opportunities at NEH, and then we'll shift uh, our focus to specific tips for writing a competitive uh, application to the Preservation Assistance uh, Grants for Smaller Institutions program. The most basic requirement uh, is that all activities must be grounded in the humanities, and all applicants to NEH uh, have to make the case for the significance of their project to the humanities. And that's a way that NEH, I think, differs from some of the other uh, federal and even state level um, granting programs. For the purpose of TAG, that means that applicants must make the case for the value of their collections that are the focus of the project. And I repeat, focus of the project, not your collections at large in your institution. Uh, and the significance, particularly for public programming, education, and research. And I'll talk a little bit more about how to do this well in a moment in terms of PAG. Uh, another uh, common theme at NEH is peer review. Uh, after and, and sort of how that evaluation process works is what I want to talk about here. Uh, after the grant deadline, we organize applications into panels, uh, usually by humanities discipline. But for PAG, it's typically by institutional type or format, so collections dealing with moving images or photographs. Um, or applications that come from organizations that are historic sites or um, archives or something along those lines. We then recruit panelists with relevant subject and methodology expertise. And for most programs, the, the panels meet in Washington, DC, and we have a full day discussion about the uh, applications. But uh, for preservation assistance grants, uh, due to the volume of applications, uh, all of the reviews are done entirely online. Now, after the panel submits their ratings, NEH staff reviews the evaluations and makes recommendations to the NEH National Council. And that's a presidentially appointed advisory board. And then they, in turn, uh, make their recommendations to the, national chair I mean, to the NEH chairman, uh, who's authorized to make grants. So that should give you a sense. We often get asked, you know, why does it take so long between the deadline and uh, the time that we're able to make an announcement about successful applications? And uh, it's because it goes through a sort of multi-phase uh, peer review process. It takes several months. Now, the final theme I want to talk about is the assistance that we can offer you. Uh, we encourage you to contact us by phone or email to discuss your projects. Uh, we can confirm eligibility, and we can provide some tips to you. For most of our grant programs, we read drafts. For PAG, again, due to the volume of applications we receive, um, we, uh, we're not able to do that. But our guidelines do include sample narratives from successful applicants. And it will give you a sense of, of what a good uh, application looks like. And, and what you know, how, why we evaluators thought it was particularly uh, a strong application. Now, if you're applying, you're turned down, or if you're successful, we also provide the evaluators comments so you can get a sense of what they thought uh, and what their opinions were about your project uh, based on their ratings. The last thing I want to mention is uh, relates to submission of applications. Uh, all, all, all applications to NEH must be submitted electronically through grants.gov. And that's a government-wide portal uh, that most federal granting uh, agencies use. And it, it provides um, a good bit of help information, a tutorial, and a checklist. Uh, it's available on their website. You can also link to these through uh, the guidelines at NEH. And, uh, it will help you get registered and help you navigate the system for submitting your application. And I, I just want to emphasize one thing. The registration for grants.gov is multi-phased. Uh, you have to go through several step, steps to do that. So we recommend that um, applicants, uh, potential applicants, register with grants.gov at least a month before a grant deadline. Uh, so make sure if you haven't, if you're, if you're planning on applying for a PAG and you haven't registered yet, now would be a good time to just go ahead and get started with that. Now, what I want to talk about at this point is just a little bit about what it takes to write a good narrative. Uh, and we'll get sort of the nitty gritty of, of that process. Uh, so begin to take good notes. Um, this is, these are the secrets. Um, as I mentioned, the guidelines are online. And it includes specific questions that we ask applicants to address. Uh, we provide a lot of direction uh, in how to respond to these questions, so a lot of uh, suggestions and examples of, of what kinds of information we want uh, in, in association with the questions that we ask in the guidelines. So be sure to follow the guidelines, answer all the questions. And what I'll do now is just go over uh, briefly each of these questions and give you some tips and pointers on, on how to grapple with them well. Uh, the first question that we ask is, what activity or activities would the grant support? Uh, and this is basically your case statement. It's, uh, we're asking, what is the nature of your project? Why is it important? And how does it relate to broader, broader preservation efforts in your institution? Another question that we ask is, uh, what are the content and size of your humanities collections that are the focus of the project? And uh, 
Well, your, your description should be at least one page long. So that's one of the five pages of your narrative. So give, us, give you a sense of the importance here. It should emphasize the humanity significance of your collections, uh, any treasures or highlights, perhaps, uh, the extent and condition of your collections, and provide a clear discussion of, of how the collections support humanity's themes. And for PAD, that's typically in American history and culture, but can certainly be broader than that. We also ask, uh, how are these humanities collections used? Uh, here we expect you to provide uh, examples of how the collections are or can be used by students, scholars, genealogists, and others in the general public. And uh, this might be in an exhibit, or it might be in support of educational programs or classroom instructional materials, or it might be for research in a range of different kinds of subjects, including how your collections might contribute to new scholarly interpretations. I want to emphasize that these two sections on use and content are really the most important part of your application. Uh, our applicants, as you can imagine, based on some of the polling questions and the information I've given you so far, uh, typically apply for very similar activities, purchase of storage supplies, preservation assessments, that sort of thing. Uh, so it's the case for humanity significance that's going to distinguish your application from the 250 to 350 others that we receive in each uh, grant cycle. Another question that we ask is, what is the nature and mission of your institution? Uh, we'll ask you to describe your mission and, and your institutional commitment to making your collections accessible to the public. Now, keep in mind that only collections that are open and accessible to the public are eligible for PAG. And we'll uh, get you to answer that question by asking you how many days of the week you're open to the public, um, your institutional capacity to support access and use of your collections, and the availability of staff for that purpose. And we'll also ask you to discuss uh, specific budget or staffing considerations that characterize your organization as a small or mid-sized institution. Which brings us uh, to really the most commonly asked question about PAG. And I think I probably answer this question every time I pick up the phone uh, to, to counsel someone on a PAG application. And that question is, how do I know if I'm small? Um, and it's a good question. Um, we're aware that many departments or many small departments and larger institutions are responsible for collections care. And as such, we don't have an institutional funding cutoff or a cutoff based on the size of your budget. But Libraries, archives, or museums that are part of a larger organization, uh, maybe a college or university, for example, uh, should provide budget information for your, your institutional unit or department. And, and that's a way that, to help you distinguish yourself as small. I mean, often it is the, the university museums or, or special collections that actually has a much smaller budget than an institution that has a, a, a much higher funding uh, ratio comparatively. So, uh, and also keep in mind, when all things being equal, uh, we will give preference to institutions uh, that, are, that, are, that have the smaller budget. So uh, keep in mind that it's an important bit of information to, to answer in the, in the grant application. Another question that we ask is, has your institution ever had a preservation or conservation assessment? And uh, here we want you to discuss the results, obviously, and how it informs your project, and, and how your project, as proposed, is going to build on the recommendations of that assessment. We also ask, what is the importance of the project to your institution? Uh, we, wanna, uh, we want you to discuss how the project fits into your institution's over overall preservation priorities, uh, including any prior planning for the project, or perhaps the level of urgency of the project for your institution and its preservation needs. Uh, we also ask for the names and qualifications of your consultants and the staff involved in the project. Uh, I just want to emphasize here that having the right staffing and consultants is really critical to the competitiveness of your application. Um, for example, don't bring in a textile conservator to conduct an archival assessment or perhaps a paper conservator to, uh, to look at your textiles. Um, you know, in, in many cases, you may have worked with a conservator in the past. You know that person. That's great. But you need to make sure their expertise is appropriate to the project at hand. And finally, the, thing that, the last thing that we ask for in the narrative is uh, a plan of work for the project. And here we want you to outline the steps of the project, the sequence of the act, uh, in which they'll occur, and indicate the staff responsible for each activity. And, and be sure that if you're requesting supplies and equipment, that they're well described and meet preservation standards, that uh, any workshops are uh, appropriate to your organization's preservation needs, and that, again, your staff uh, and consultants have the right experience. A couple of final things that will uh, be included in your application is obviously a budget. We ask for an itemized budget showing your project's expenses. And to help with this, we provide a sample template uh, in the guidelines uh, that will show you sort of how to set that up. Uh, and uh, keep in mind that each expense uh, listed in your budget must be uh, explained somehow in the narrative and in your work plan. And then finally, we get a good bit of supporting documentation in our applications that go beyond that five-page narrative. Uh, if you've had that prior assessment, we'd like to see an executive summary, again, how it, uh, your project builds on those recommendations. 
uh, vendor estimates for supplies or equipment, including quantity and cost, uh, workshop descriptions. Uh, if you're hiring a consultant, uh, keep in mind that a letter of commitment from that consultant is absolutely mandatory. And the letter, the letter should indicate buy-in or commitment on the part of that consultant. Uh, and, and their letter should track or, or document um, the activities that are described in the narrative. So we want something beyond, uh, yes, I intend to be there in the month of June. We want to make sure that the activities that they have in mind uh, correspond to what you've written in your narrative. And then finally, uh, brief resumes for staff and letters of support. Uh, typically, letters of support are from scholars uh, underscoring the humanity significance of your collection or perhaps uh, uh, support from prior consultants that know your collection. Now, here's the evaluation criteria that we ask our reviewers to address. And you'll see that they're basically evaluating how well you've answered the questions that we've just covered. Uh, real emphasis on humanity's significance here, including the content of the collections and their use. Uh, and we also ask our evaluators to uh, assess the uh, level of accessibility of your collection. So uh, some of the things that I talked about earlier in terms of uh, how many days you're open uh, to the public and availability of staff to provide access to collections. Uh, we also have them look at the feasibility of the proposed activities and how they'll contribute to your institutional capacity to preserve your collections, make them accessible, and then the adequacy of uh, your plan of work, staffing, and budget. Now, I um, don't want to dwell on the negative here, but I just want to mention there, there are several activities that PAG won't fund. And we have those listed uh, and itemized in our guidelines. And I would encourage you, as you're drafting your uh, narrative, to be familiar with that list. Uh, Um, ineligible activities, we, we have to render that application ineligible. And we hate to do that. We don't want to send out that letter, and you don't want to receive it either. So if you have any questions about um, the eligibility of your uh, activities that you're planning for your proposal, again, don't hesitate to, to give us a call, and we can certainly talk through that with you. And uh, I'll just close with a few final tips, uh, sort of summarizing some of the points I've already made. Be sure to follow the guidelines, answer all the questions that I just went through, uh, and answer them fully. Uh, remember the importance of humanity significance for or any kind of application submitted to the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, give us a call. Talk with us about your projects. Uh, review the sample proposals and FAQs that we have uh, with the guidelines. And uh, if you're turned down, uh, request those comments and, and consider reapplying. Uh, so at this point, I think what I'd like to do is, is shift gears and, and turn the tables a bit and, and open this up to your uh, questions. I noticed there's been uh, several that have popped up on the side screen. And I think Kristen and Elsa will help me uh, maybe fo uh, focus in on a few of those and uh, get some of those answered. And we can certainly um, talk about your needs and, and how they might be met by PAG. We can return to prior slides. Uh, we can. Uh, I can provide advice uh, for particular projects as well. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you. That's great, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was great. I, um, I have been pulling over some questions. And I'm not going to go quite in order here. But the question I thought maybe we could start with was from Sue Chin in New York. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I'll just read you the question first. She said, would it be possible to apply for multiple grants for different collections? For instance, our institution manages multiple small archives. And then there was a follow-up question from Piper um, Ferreter in Tallahassee saying, ditto, and would the managing organization apply, or should the application come from one of the smaller entities that are being managed? I think this is a little bit different from the slide you showed us that was talking about the size of the institution, like if an archive was part of a, a university. But mm -hmm. could you say something about this? Yeah, I'll answer uh, both questions in turn. Okay. And uh, first of all, we often receive multiple applications from an institution. Now, if you're applying in a particular grant cycle, um, you'll want to, unless, let me, let me try to phrase this carefully. If, if you're applying from a large institution, you know, a, a large statewide university, for example, and you're coming to us from very different departments, perhaps it's the special collections in a library uh, on campus, and perhaps there's an unaffiliated museum on the other side of campus, it's perfectly fine to submit two applications to us. But the same entity, the same special collections unit, uh, shouldn't apply in the same grant cycle. Um, but having said that, we often see applicants come to us in multiple years. So perhaps beginning with that first preservation assessment, you get the recommendations. You determine that storage is your priority. You come back to us in the next year uh, requesting funding for storage, upgrades, uh, shelving units, that sort of thing. And then maybe. Uh, your next priority is planning for disaster preparedness or, or some specialized training for, for staff uh, and come back in an, an additional year. Sometimes you can combine activities 
uh, if you can do this within the small amount that's allocated for the grant, um, you can combine different activities uh, within, a, within one application as well. Now, in terms of which unit should apply, that's going to be answered to some degree by your grants development office and uh, the grants.gov system that I mentioned earlier. Uh, grants.gov will ask for a registration unit for your uh, organization. And often, that's going to be the broader, uh, perhaps university-wide or, or library system-wide uh, unit. And that's registered with grants.gov. And you'll have some institutional limitations on, on that process. Your, your, your folks there will tell you, you know, we're already registered and you need to apply through, through us. But it's, it's very clear to us you know, when you begin to write that case statement, some other things that I talked about, that it's an individual unit within that larger organization that uh, is applying for the specific funding. So the answer, I guess, in some ways, it varies from institution to institution. But typically, uh, based on the nature of grants.gov, it's going to be the larger entity. OK. I'm going to move a little bit further back now. Um, Kathy Gow in Hatfield, Massachusetts said, Elizabeth, we are just starting the inventory of our collection. Would it still be appropriate to apply for a general, general preservation assessment now, or would we need to wait until our inventory is complete several years, parenthetically, hopefully, down the road? Well, I think the answer to that is I think there's no problem with applying for a preservation assessment at this point. Uh, you would need to have enough intellectual control over the collection to be able to give us a cohesive description in terms of humanity significance. Um, so if you, if you don't know what you have yet, um, then it's going to be hard to make that case. But if you've got a strong enough sense of what you have and you're able to, to answer uh, the questions that I described earlier, you know, some highlights, some treasures, the kind of scholarly uh, research that could be done in the collections, uh, that kind of thing, then, then you're probably ready and a preservation assessment at this point might be useful to you. Uh, be able to identify some priorities, but uh, but you'll need to have enough intellectual control over it to be able to describe the collections at large and to, to get a, evaluators a sense of of um, the humanity significance of the materials. So it's kind of a, it's it's a depends answer again once again, but you know you'll know at the institutional level when you're ready to to make that case. Okay. Is the deadline always um, May first? No, it's uh, usually based on, you know, sometimes May 1st might be on a Sunday or something along those lines. Okay. So we try to, we aim for uh, not having a deadline on a Friday or Monday, and, and usually it'll be as close to the first of the month as we can get it. I think it was on the third last year. I just happened to fall on the first this year. Okay. But it's the beginning of May, typically. Okay. Uh, LaVon Williams in Memphis, Tennessee had said there his institution will be undertaking a preservation assessment in April. and won't be prepared for this deadline, but when's the following one? So I think that probably covers that question. If we didn't, then please write back in. Right, and I, I would say you know the, the CAP grant that does something similar, what, uh, Chris, your deadline is in the fall? Uh, she's not on the audio oh, right now, definitely. but uh, yes. Yeah. I can find out when it is exactly is this year. I think Christian will write in. So we often get that second tier kind of um, application to implement recommendations from an assessment that perhaps it was a conservation assessment program uh, sponsored the initial assessment. And then you know it's perfectly feasible to come back into TAG uh, to address some of those recommendations from, from an assessment funded through uh, that, that process as well. OK. Um, we have a couple of questions about specifics of eligibility. Um, Catherine Wright from Forney, Texas wrote, we are a very small museum, and currently I am the only paid employee, but I'm only paid for 30 hours a week, although I work about 35. Do you have to have one full-time employee to apply for this grant? Yeah, we ask for sort of one full-time or equivalent. And so it's perfectly acceptable. I mean, we're, we know that we're aiming for smaller institutions that are often uh, very minimally staffed. And so uh, you can cobble together three or four volunteers. Um, you know, maybe a couple of part-time folks. And uh, mostly what we're trying to get at is that you have enough staffing to reasonably make your collections available to the public so that you have access, so that they have access to them. So if it's something along the lines of we have one volunteer who, um, you know, will, will show up on appointment, then maybe that's not quite the equivalent. But if you've got several volunteers and a couple of part-time staff, then uh, you can couple that together and, and make it the equivalent. OK. Kathy Gao had another question sort of along those lines. She said, one reason we haven't applied in the past was the need to meet the eligibility requirements of being open a set number of days. Now mm -hmm. the guidelines seem a little more flexible. Is that mm -hmm. true? Yes, I'm, I'm glad she, she noticed that. We changed the guidelines this year. And uh, we were aware, I think, that 120 days, while an important sort of 
bar for accessibility of collections. In, in some instances, we were getting institutions that have intentions to make their collections available very soon, and, and even in some cases, the kinds of activities associated with the preservation assistance proposal, our application is you know, contingent on, on that accessibility. So we have decided to pull back on giving a specific number of days where institutions have to be open, and we're going to have our evaluators assess um, accessibility as part of their uh, evaluation criteria. Uh, so we're not going to have a set date. We just want you to, to convince our evaluators that uh, you're committed to uh, making your collections available to the public uh, and that they are accessible. And again, I, I have to emphasize that, they, that your collections must be accessible uh, as part of uh, to, to be eligible for PAG. So. Okay. The staff question we had about cobbling together. The, um, Martha in Omaha asked, how qualified does staff have to be? We do not have anyone trained in archival work. We are having to train ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's uh, pretty typically the case with many institutions that um, apply to, to preservation assistance grants. It's, uh, you know, it, it depends on the nature of your project. I mean, you know, but in most cases, one of the things that we do with a PAG uh, grant is to help you get the training for your staff and volunteers that you need. So. Uh, if you can identify, you know, where that need is, you can certainly come into PAG and get additional training. Um, you know, we want to see that if we're providing, for example, um, rehousing supplies, uh, that you're going to have staff that understands how to do that, um, what's needed to, to rehouse those materials successfully. If you're applying for environmental monitoring equipment, we want to be sure that you, um, you know, have staff that's going to be able to use it and, and compile that data in reasonable ways. We don't expect that you have that in place, but if you don't have it in place, you might want to combine uh, the purchase of that equipment with some training opportunities supported through PAG. And again, if you can do that for um, $6,000, and, and often our applicants are, are able to do that, um, we would encourage you to combine those two activities. Okay. Kristen weighed in and said the cap deadline is actually on uh, December 1st, unless that's oh, okay. a Sunday. Okay. So um, Elizabeth in Sioux Falls asked, is it better to wait until the cap assessment is completed to apply for the PAC? Uh, yeah, probably, especially if you've never had a preservation assessment. Okay. Um, you know, you often folks are surprised maybe at some of the prioritized recommendations that come out of those assessments. And while they're assuming a recommendation is going to be for uh, storage or something, it turns out that they've got a, a Pretty intense, you know, uh, pest or mold problem that they didn't anticipate. Uh, so sometimes it can be surprising, and it's all, and you can make a better case in your proposal if you're able to to summarize the prioritized recommendations that came out of that assessment. So it's a good idea to go ahead and do that. Okay. Jack McCarthy in Philadelphia asked, "Is a qualified consultant report or assessment always required?" Um, in terms of applying for sort of a next phase. Um, I think so. I mean, I, I think he was probably going off the, the bulleted list on the PowerPoint. So I guess what I'm trying to get is, is the question, is it a qualified consultant, where the emphasis is, or whether it's the uh, assessment? Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm not sure. Maybe, John, really could you write in and, yeah. and, and say a little bit something else about that? Um, at, in the meantime, Jenny Love had another question along those lines. Does that letter of commitment need to be signed, or is an emailed copy sufficient? An email copy is fine, um, you know, just as long as it has that person's, you know, signature at the bottom and, and a date and all of that, the, the information associated with the, with the, um, with the email is sufficient for us, uh, so it doesn't have to be a hand, hand uh, blind copy. Jack Again, the importance there is that the, the letter of commitment from the, um, from the consultant really needs to uh, emphasize the kinds of things that you've identified in your plan of work. I, we sometimes get letters from consultants that just seem you know, boilerplate or open-ended, and they never do very well uh, in evaluation because it doesn't seem that the consultant um, has really been involved or, or discussed uh, the project at hand. So it, it comes off as a weaker application. So very important that they, they identify uh, some of the activities that you're planning to have them address. Jack has gotten back to us. In the meantime, I just wanted to say we will be making this presentation available later in PDF format. Um, now, Jack said the emphasis was on qualified consultant. Yeah, I mean, it's very important that you get a qualified consultant. And um, we don't provide lists of you know, individuals to, to pull on, but there are a lot of resources out there uh, to find consultants. Um, we often see institutions bringing in preservation uh, professionals from their local university, the regional field services. 
uh, all have uh, individuals who do these consultations, uh, the professional organizations uh, in conservation and preservation, uh, you know, all have individuals that, that can help you um, either find a consultant or can do the consultations themselves. But uh, yeah, we'll ask that you include a resume uh, for your consultant, and it should so show that they have uh, a level of expertise associated with the kinds of objects or, or formats that they'll be assessing. In a second, I'll also post the URL for AIC site where you can find right. okay. people. Um, all right, sorry, one second here. I'm just catching up with the questions because they're starting to come in quick. Um, let's see. Okay, we have a couple questions about size. Um, Martha asked a little bit earlier on. Let's see here. Martha Jackson in Raleigh, what determines institutional size, staff or budget or both? What is the maximum? Yeah, like I said earlier, um, we don't have a funding cutoff. This. We're aware that um, many large institutions have uh, smaller departments that really can have you know, very minimal funding uh, that are responsible for collections care. Um, so it's not unusual that maybe a small campus museum uh, is operating on a shoestring. Uh, and so we don't want to say, you know, because your broader institutional budget's in the millions, um, therefore no aspect of your organization can be able to apply to PAD. We want to keep that flexible. So again, it's important that you uh, Submit the departmental budget that you have, uh, and, and not put your broader institutional budget. And uh, that's the information we're looking for. Uh, there is no cutoff in terms of the size of staff we see, um, or or for the size of the budget. We see a wide range of answers uh, to those questions. Uh, and uh, so I said earlier, all things being equal, um, if we're trying to, you know, make recommendations for funding, and um, we've got limited resources in terms of the amounts of uh, money that we have for these awards uh, will give preference or consideration to uh, truly small institutions and institutions that have never applied to PAG before. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you know, there, there's no funding cutoff. Is the amount of funding available for this year comparable to that for other years? Ann Dalton is asking. Um, well, I could, you know, I did have an extra slide that I didn't include. And, and Elsa, if you want to bring I mean, that, sure. that was up after my contact information, which I should have put up also. That's OK. I'll pull that up in one second. Uh, maybe I could go ahead and get to it. There we go. Um, I, th I thought I might get this question. So I'll give you a sense of, um, now our appropriation in 2011 was a, a little bit lower than the year before. Uh, and then you saw a, a little bit of a decline in 2012. Right now, we're very much in the um, you know active phase in terms of what the 2013 budget is going to be. It still needs to go uh, into discussion at the, in the House and in the Senate. And so we don't have any feedback at this point. But the request that the President has made for this agency overall is $154 million, a little over $154 million, which is, is up and put us, puts us back on par with 2011. And you'll see um, of that, a uh, little over $15 million uh, will go to the Division of Preservation Access. And then that funding is divided up amongst all of the grant programs that we support in the division. So uh, it'll give you a sense, I think, in terms of, of where we sit right now vis-a-vis uh, -vis other years. Now, 2013, it's not over till you know, Congress, House and the Senate come to an agreement and make an appropriation. But uh, you'll see right now where the request is. OK. I'll go back to that contact slide. Uh, and then let's look at Linda's question. Linda Endersby from Jefferson City says, as a state agency, we have to bid for consultant services. And we can't do that until after the grant is awarded. Mm -hmm. Can we list the qualifications that would be part of the bid in the grant application rather than naming a specific consultant? Yeah, that's um, often an, an issue. And, and what we'd like for you to do, and we know it's tricky, but what we'd like for you to do is to um, have a couple of folks in mind and have some commitment from them. And you can just make it plain in your proposal that you're going to have to go through an RFP process as part of your institutional requirements. But um, what we need to know, what we're trying to avoid is that you get a grant and then you can't find a consultant. Um, so what we'd like for you to do is get on that consultant's calendar, more or less, and uh, have a commitment from them that if they're chosen in the RFP process, and if, if for your institutional needs you need to offer a couple of different people, uh, that's fine, too. Um, just make it plain in your application that you have some institutional requirements around being able to identify a a particular consultant. OK. R. Stearns in Shreveport says, for a proposal requesting a preservation assessment, would you recommend highlighting the importance of an archive's entire collection or highlighting specific collections? Um, you need to make the case for the collections that are going to be the focus of the project. So for an assessment, that tends to be pretty wide ranging. So what you should do is maybe a little bit of both. I mean, talk in, in terms of that describes the collection, your archival collection at large. 
Uh, and then you may want to draw out some particular highlights, um, you know, maybe some early diaries or, or whatever you feel are the particular treasures, materials that perhaps have been used in exhibition frequently or are often asked for by by students using the collection or whatever the case might be. So, you know, provide good examples that illuminate uh, some themes uh, in terms of your collection at large. Okay. Linda Simmons Henry in North Carolina is asking, does the grant cover hiring someone to process the collection? Is that, I'm, I'm not sure if right. process means catalog or? Right. Yeah, thanks for asking that. It's, um, we, we don't fund labor in preservation assistance grants. Um, we have other grants that do that. Our, our humanities collections and reference resources uh, typically is the grant program that, that funds uh, arrangement and description of collections. And the reason for that is it's just with $6,000, it's just there's just not enough money um, to really support that in any meaningful way. Uh, but what we do in, in TAG is uh, provide education and training uh, in how to uh, arrange and describe archival collections or catalog uh, museum objects and, and that sort of thing. So to give your, your staff the training that they need to, to learn how to do that. Judy Knight in Laramie asked uh, a little while ago, I'd like to apply for a disaster preparedness. Can we use PAG funds to pay first responders to come for a full-on drill here and for the purchase of fire extinguishers? Um, I need to look at the proposal a little bit more carefully. Um, there are certain kinds of things that we don't fund in PAG um, that sometimes sounds a little odd. We do fund, certainly, disaster planning kits. And you can often uh, find those uh, easily from a number of different kinds of vendors. And that's often a request that we get. Uh, with an application. Um, it is good, I think, to bring in outside responders to, uh, even in, in, in part, as part of an assessment um, and that sort of thing. But again, the, the focus of the kinds of activities in PAG is really on the collections. Uh, and this is a little leaning towards the, 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 um, the staffing. And what I would do in that case is encourage you to give me a call, and we can talk a little bit about where you are, the process, the nature of your collections and your institutions, and kind of hone down on a uh, set of activities that would make the most sense for your institution. Okay. We only have a couple minutes left, so I'm just trying to get to these. Um, Anna in New York said, would the hiring of an architect to draw up plans for a storage room be a good match for this grant? We were funded by PAG for conservator and architect to draw up preliminary drawings for a storage room, and we are looking for the next step of more detailed architectural drawings of the building in order to continue to proceed forward. This would not be a bricks and mortar project. Right. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. Um, the, the answer to that is we actually have another grant program that I think is a little bit more appropriate for that kind of activity. And it's really going to depend, uh, in terms of that program, uh, where you are in your planning at this point. But that's our Sustaining Cultural Heritage Collections grant program. And the goal of that grant program is actually to bring together teams of uh, architects, engineers, preservation professionals, uh, facilities folks, and take a look holistically um, at facilities and storage uh, and, and the nature of your collections and start to, to think about sustainable practices for um, storing and, and taking care of maintaining collections. Uh, and so I'd be happy to, to talk and with uh, the person that submitted this question uh, about that grant program. In some cases, you know, where they are, where their needs are really more appropriate for preservation assistance grants, uh, and they need to take that step and get some groundwork in place before they're ready for that next step. But if an institution is there and they're ready to start working with an architect, uh, then I think the Sustaining Cultural Heritage Collections grant program is uh, a better fit for the kinds of activities that they described. OK. I have a question from Ellen Sullivan in Santa Fe. Must one's collection be considered 100% humanities related to be eligible? If some of our collection is considered art, is it safe to assume we should exclude those items from a proposed NEH funding request? Well, we consider art history uh, as one of the humanities. And so we often, and have funded frequently, um, conservation assessments of paintings, of sculpture, uh, the, the Greek ceramics that I described in one of my examples. Uh, you just need to frame your case uh, in terms of humanity significance uh, in an art history sort of perspective. Uh, so the, the humanities themes that are there, the history of art, uh, the impact of the the materials, perhaps an exhibit uh, in, in research and that kind of thing. But uh, no, it's, it's not uncommon at all for us to uh, to deal with, with art museums in this grant program. We get a number of applications from art museums. OK, great. For a general preservation assessment, is it better to hire one consultant with broad expertise who can make recommendations of priorities or hire several experts in different areas? 
specific to, I guess, the materials there. Right. Yeah. I mean, again, that's one of those it depends questions. Uh, we see both, and it depends on the complexity of your collections. Uh, I, I've seen many applications where there's a general preservation assessment that's going to be done by a, a person with sort of broad-ranging expertise that's looking at the facilities and the collections at large, but they know that their uh, photographic materials or moving image materials are particularly at risk, and they want a little bit more detailed assessment. So they bring in a team of two consultants. Uh, one that's going to focus uh, and hone down on those uh, specialized formats while the other person provides a more broader perspective. Um, and then in some cases, it's, it's appropriate to, to bring in that, that broader expertise. It just depends on where you feel your risks are uh, and, the, and the nature of expertise required to address that. And again, that's something that we can help you with uh, if you give us a call and uh, we can talk a little bit more about the nature of your, your collections and provide more specific advice. Anna um, has said, what number shall I use to contact you to follow up on my question? And Elizabeth very kindly has made all of her contact information available there on the screen. I wanted to point that out. And I'd like to encourage everyone also to um, visit the Connecting to Collections.org website where we have general discussion boards. A lot of these questions, I think, are relevant to a number of people. And if we can foster a conversation there, it will be helpful to people beyond this. Um, we'll be, we have recorded this webinar, and we'll be archiving it and making it available also on the website. And um, I'm, let's see here. OK, thanks so much. Um, and we're at the end. So I want to encourage everyone. I'm sure there are more questions to put them up there. We'll make the recording available and also this presentation available in PDF format. And yes, Jerry in Vermont, if your question was not answered, you may contact her directly. That information should be right up there on the screen. Yeah, please do. Be happy to answer any questions. Well, Elizabeth, this has been, I I'm certain very helpful to our participants and very interesting. And, and I want to thank you for taking the time and for the excellent presentation and for all of the good information that I know people are going to find very useful in filling out their applications. And I thank you all. It was a real pleasure to do this. And uh, thank you all for the input that you provided uh, for us. It will be very useful as we uh, think about the parameters of the grant program as well. They were great questions. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. Thank you very much, everybody. And I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.